95% of our patterns and beliefs are outside of our conscious awareness. Helena Day is not your average coach. As a subconscious rewriting expert, she's on a mission to revolutionize the way leaders and entrepreneurs approach personal growth. We're not taught to deal with failures. We're taught to deal with successes. Her goal, to help you declutter your internal world so you can quantum leap your impact, income and visibility, all while maintaining life harmony. If you can change the things in your environment which aren't supporting you in the direction you want to go in, then you have a much, much greater chance of success. With over a decade of experience in human development and 2,500 plus coaching hours under her belt, she honed a deep understanding of transformation and change. Everything in terms of change and transformation, everything starts with awareness. Hey, I'm your host, Gay Marushka, with the Master Entrepreneur Show. Quick one before the episode starts. About 80% of you watching, you didn't hit that follow or subscribe button. If you get any value from this, if the stories we share and the learnings that you get from my guests help you or your business in any way, can you please do me a favor and hit that follow or subscribe button? It helps the show more than you can even imagine. And the bigger the show gets, the better the guest gets. Thank you so much and enjoy the episode. Helena, most of us, especially in business setting, we blame our failures due to external factors. Why is that? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. My work is predominantly with entrepreneurs and high-performing professionals, helping them really get an understanding of what's going on in their businesses, what's working, what isn't, what the challenges are. And it's something that I notice a lot. It's a lot easier to blame our challenges, our blocks on something external to us, rather than having to turn the lens and look inside and say, what is going on with me? What am I doing to contribute to this problem? What saboteurs do I have that are showing up in my business, in my work, in my life? So it is just much easier to be able to look externally and say, oh, it's because I didn't have the support or I didn't have the investment or blame something external to us. Yeah, unfortunately, that's often the case. And I would love to know what's the most common internal factor that is actually standing in entrepreneurs' way to succeed from what you experience with your clients? Yeah, so there are many. And I think one that I see show up time and time again is a real fear of failure. And it shows up in our businesses because we start procrastinating around things. We don't take the action that we know we need to take. We might not even get started on projects, even on that business. And underlying all of this sits this fear. What happens if I fail? What does that mean about me? Can I cope with that? It's the real discomfort that we have to experience if we do fail. We're not taught to deal with failures. We're taught to deal with successes. And so we don't have their resilience, many of us, to bounce back and to really see those failings as a gift, as something that we get to take learnings from, pick ourselves up from. We just see it as something that stops us from really going all out in our businesses or moving to the next level. Indeed, and I think that's the big differentiator between extremely successful entrepreneurs and those that are just wannabe entrepreneurs because the second they stop at the first failure they really cannot go past that they don't have the resilience to go past that probably some of them are listening to us and they want to overcome that they want to uncover inside them that stopping them for acting and learning from their mistakes when they fail how they can overcome that 
So everything in terms of change and transformation, everything starts with awareness. If we do not have awareness, we cannot change or shift anything. And so it really starts with us really digging deep and uncovering these patterns and recognizing when that shows up for us, when it shows up in our lives, when that pattern, that fear of what other people will think, the judgment they might have if we fail, when that is showing up for us. And if we can start to have that awareness, then we can start to really reframe what failure means. Because we've been programmed from a very young age to believe that failure is something bad. It starts at school, you know, with you have to succeed, you have to get good grades. If you fail, you know, you're the dunce of the class. And so we have to reframe that within ourselves. And it really gets to be about finding the learning and the silver lining in every single one of those failures. I love to look at it like going to the gym, the failure gym. And so I have this little exercise that I have with my kids where I say to them every day after school, what did you fail at today? So that they can normalize for themselves that it's okay to fail because we're not taught this enough. We're not told this enough. We don't tell ourselves enough that it is okay to fail, that we don't have to make it mean anything about ourselves if we do fail. And we can pick ourselves up and really learn and grow from the experience. I love that approach because even those that don't experience failure, let's say in business for the first months or years and so on, when they do experience because they are not used to it, they simply crumble and they don't know what to do, how to react in that scenario. And what's interesting for me, because most of the times we we are not aware what it's actually holding us back. We experience that you're not allowed to fail when we are young and arrive at a certain age when you literally have no idea how to be aware of what exactly is going on, why these things are happening to me. What can arrive at a state of awareness in order to avoid being stopped by a simple or a single failure in our life? So the awareness really comes from us digging deep. Like I I think if you carry a journal around with you and you start to do the reflection work, because awareness is really about self-reflection. It's about when things happen in your life, can you sit down and reflect and go, okay, what was my part in this? What was my responsibility in this? How did it feel? These kind of questions that start to unearth some of the things underneath. So it's really about carving out the space for that reflection and that awareness work. And many of us don't do that because it's much easier to keep busy and keep productive. Because when we pause, when we really pause in the self-awareness, sometimes we have to deal with things which are really uncomfortable. And so we don't want to. We don't want to do that. So it's easier to just keep moving, to keep progressing, to keep taking action. But when we do that, we never actually get to the crux of what is happening for us what those patterns are which are informing how we're working in our businesses. And this is the work that I do with my clients. It's helping them to get a real understanding of what those patterns are which are impacting how they run their businesses. And a lot of it is, it's not easy. And your question wasn't easy to answer because a lot of what's happening in our patterning is completely not in our awareness, unless we dig deep and we dig deeper and we ask ourselves why. Because we're like, our conscious awareness is like the tip of an iceberg, 5%. Everything at the bottom of that iceberg, 95% of our patterning is completely outside of our conscious awareness. 
really just carving out the time, allowing yourself, prioritizing the time and space to do some self-awareness work, to do some reflection work is so important. And when do you think is the best time of the day to do so? Early anytime. morning when you are anytime? <laughs> anytime, 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 honestly. Because I, I'm asking because I try a couple of times to do, for example, in the evening when let's say a day didn't work out the way I plan or a day that let's say by today's standards, it was a failure. And Sometimes it works well in the sense that I have all the information from that day and I can be aware of the things that I was doing the way I should do it and the things that I was doing wrong and so on. But in the same time, because the day went quite badly, I didn't have the mental energy to actually dive deep into those things. And I try as well in the mornings to literally put everything on paper, what went good, what went bad the other day and so on, and to see the failures, to see what I can learn from them and as well, why those happened. And sometimes that worked well, sometimes didn't. That's why I ask because I thought there is like a specific time of the day when we can be more aware of what's happening around us to be able to actually dig deeper. And actually, even the way you framed that question is something that we look for as humans. Like we're looking for this set of rules. We're looking for this knowing, this certainty. It has to be done this way because then we can feel like, okay, we got it right. Tick. We got it right. The real truth about personal development is that it is so unique to each and every one of us. It's why when I see like five tools to do, you know, follow these steps, one, two, three. Sometimes I wonder, because we're all so different and unique inside, what works for one person in the morning, their morning reflection. I have clients that do what they call the morning pages, where they sit down and they literally brain dump before they start their day. And this is part of their routine and it works so well for them. And then I have other clients who prefer to reflect at the end of the day. And this is where they can look back over all of their day and they can really reflect and look at what worked well and what didn't work well. And then I have other clients that look to carry a journal around with them and to pause after something happens in the moment to say, okay, what was going on for me? What were those fears? What am I aware of? What am I noticing about myself? So there is no one size fits all, even though we would love there to be. We would love there to be, okay, 7.45, everybody do their self-awareness work. But there isn't, like we really have to tune in and work out what works well for us. And it might be that reflecting in the morning works really well for you for like a month. And then it might be that it starts feeling off and actually you change up your routine. And so then it works well in the afternoon and the evening. It does not have to be consistent the same time every single day. Like we get to decide, we get to tune in and really feel what feels good to us, what works well for us at that moment, in that moment. You see, that was my tactical brain jumping into it and trying to find a framework, trying to find the perfect time to do this. And indeed, you're absolutely right. That's why sometimes it works, sometimes it didn't, because literally, you need to find that moment that worked for us and try to see for how long and if not, to be flexible and time to change and to change that. And I love what you mentioned about one of your clients that carry a journal with them in order to be able to reflect on that particular scenario immediately after that happened. And I think that's a brilliant idea because we often forget the small details that can hold the truth for what exactly happened in that moment that can help us to overcome it in the future or to be aware of uh, any particular thing that our subconscious is playing to us. And speaking of subconscious, you're an expert in rewriting subconscious. How that actually works? As I was talking about before, we have 95% of our patterns and beliefs are outside of our conscious awareness. 
we don't even know they're there. They're laid down when, generally when we're very young, between naught and eight years old, when our brain is in an alpha brain state. So it's in a very suggestible brain state and we're downloading all of these rules and norms of how we should behave so we can become a functioning member of society. And so this then becomes our programming, these beliefs that get programmed into us at such a young age. And what we don't realize as adults is that this programming is still informing our choices, our decisions that we make. And much of it is, as you would imagine, outdated because the beliefs that you lay down when you're five years old are very different to the beliefs that you might want to be working with when you're an adult and you're launching a very successful business. So this process of really starting to rewire the subconscious can be so impactful for entrepreneurs. So your question was asking, how can we do that? And again, starting with awareness. So you can do some of the awareness work yourself where you really start to dive down into looking at some of the patterns which are showing up in your business. What are reoccur- what's reoccurring for you? What are you noticing? Are there types of people that you are attracting? Are there similar scenarios that keep showing up? Because this is where the patterning is easiest to find. But really, honestly, we have blind spots as people. So as much of this as we can do ourselves, and you can really make a good start, there will still be blind spots and things which perhaps you're just completely unaware of. And then it's always good to work with a professional, and there's lots of different people that work in this field to help you really start to understand what some of that programming is. And then in my work, I use lots of hypnotherapy and deep subconscious reprogramming methodologies so that I can actually rewire the brain because our brains are actually malleable. They're changeable. Um, We can actually create new neural highways in our brains And so we can implant new visuals, we can implant new beliefs, and these become the new neural highways that then becomes our patterning. So it's about upgrading, looking for those places where our patterning is outdated, and then upgrading those through methodologies, implanting new beliefs, implanting new visuals, really letting go of some of the baggage, which is keeping those old, outdated beliefs in place. And I would love to tackle both approaches, the one that we can do ourselves and the one that we ask for help. And especially I want to tackle into hypnotherapy. But before I want to discuss about the work that we can do alone to do so let's say someone that is listening identify a pattern in attracting the wrong clients the clients that are draining that are done not paying them their worth and so on and they identify the same type of clients are coming to their world starting from there what other things they can do, what other questions they can ask themselves to dive deeper and to see why is that happening? Why those type of clients keep entering my world? What I'm doing wrong there? And so you used one of the words, you used a word there, which is so potent, which is why. And you can keep asking yourself that question to keep diving down under the layers of what's going on what's going on. So you start with the the problem itself and you can ask why and you can go another level deeper and then you can ask why and you can go another level deeper and you can ask why and you can go another level deeper. Okay. We're just like layers of a onion. We have lots of different layers that we need to go through to get to the actual root cause of much of what is happening for us in our lives. If you can start to identify a pattern, 
I'm not attracting the right clients. You can really just start diving down under the surface with the why question. And it's a powerful one. And I love the fact that you mentioned this because it's one of the questions that I tried to ask myself. I was in that situation, that's why I asked. And uh, what I identify is that I was a people pleaser. I was afraid to not let people down by saying no to them. Even that I noticed that they are not my ideal clients. I envisioned that there will be a problematic project and I'll be frustrated because instead of focusing on the other type of projects, I'll be losing a lot of time with them and so on. And by keep on asking those questions, I was noticing that I ignore red flags. I ignore my own gut feeling that I should say no to that particular project and so on. And yeah, it's in our own control to do so. But let's say we go to the other pattern of hypnotherapy. We arrive at the point where no matter what type of self-reflection we do or self-work, we are not able to change something. And we are continuing to go on the same treadmill that, and we don't find an answer to anything how hypnotherapy works and what are the benefits? Yeah, so there's lots of different types of hypnotherapy. I use my own signature process and methodology. And so say we were to use the people pleaser pattern, which you discovered in yourself. We can make these discoveries through our awareness and our self-reflection. And that's really fantastic to have that awareness of how we show up and maybe some of the archetypes which are in our system, which we are presenting to the world, which are powerful for us. And then we really, in hypnotherapy, we really dive down, I in my process, into the why, into finding those core events and situations that have shaped what the people pleaser became so dominant in your system. What was it that happened in your life that caused this to be one of your predominant characteristics? And then we can go and do some deep healing and transformational work around this and implant new visuals and new understandings around the fact that, for example, with the people pleaser, you can be really sure of your own value. You can have a rock solid value. You cannot need to look outside of yourself for other people's approval or recognition. So we can really start to rewire that. With a people pleaser, there's often a lot of fear of letting people down and disappointing people. So we can really start in hypnotherapy to start healing some of that fear of what happens if I disappoint somebody? What happens if I let them down? There's a lot of it which often goes back to childhood and the um, relationship that we had in our families with our parents as well. So there's often some deep healing work that has to happen there in order for us to fully let go of these patterns and then wire in new patterns. And the way I use hypnotherapy is to provide the entrepreneurs I work with dedicated recordings, which they listen to daily after our sessions, which really wire in these new visuals and beliefs so that every single day they're reconnecting with a vision for where they want to go, for what they want to bring to life, for what they want to create. First time when I was interacting with this visualization part not sure if you remember because it's quite an old movie i think it, uh, it's called the secret if i'm not mistaken i think there the imagination and i was like you can actually try to rewrite the way you are thinking the way you are viewing life and by visualizing a different one and it worked fantastically well i tried by myself but when you do every ever after every session they get a recording in which they start listening to it they imagine the new things the new life the new way of being i think that's really powerful especially because any habit can be life-changing and can be 
pattern changing if you want. And when you notice the change start to happen after you start working with your clients, when they see a real change in their business and life? Ah, that's such an interesting question and one that everybody wants to know when. And it is, I'm going to say it is so dependent on the individual. It depends on how deep the patterns are that they're working with, how many patterns that we are transforming. It depends how easy those patterns are to rewire. It depends if they're connected to some deeply embedded trauma. If there's a lot of work to do, taking you right back to healing with family and parents and informing some of those patterns today. So there is no one answer I can give you. For some people, change can be instantaneous. They can leave a session and they can feel like they have dropped a weight that their life feels completely different. And for others, it's a longer process where they're really, there's little nuances which they're noticing. And when they look back, they're like, oh my goodness, I don't do this anymore. I often think with change, we don't notice it a lot of the time when it's happening. It's like when we're growing, we don't notice that we're growing in height. Like my kids don't know that they're, you know, growing an extra centimeter. It just happens. And often I find that this is the same with change. It's when we look back and we go, you know, for example, if we're talking about height, we say, oh my gosh, this doesn't fit anymore. How is that? And it's the same with change. Sometimes we look back and say, oh my gosh, I just don't think like this anymore. I just, I used to do this every day and now I just don't do it anymore. So in answer to your question, there is no one size fits all and it's so dependent on the individual. Yeah, true. And one thing that I noticed that worked tremendously well for me, and I would like to ask you as well how that changed your life, is by changing my environment. Since I became a nomad five years ago, by changing my environment, not spending time with the same people, change a lot the way I see the world, the way I act, the way I behave and so on. And since you live in London, Amsterdam, now in Bali, how the environment change shape who you are today and how people can change their life by changing their environment? Yeah, there's a wonderful quote. You can't send a changed person back into an unchanged environment because the changes just don't stick. Now, I've not found that to be my experience, but what I know for sure is that if you can change the things in your environment which aren't supporting you in the direction you want to go in, then you have a much, much greater chance of success Something you actually mentioned was really interesting. You talked about changing up the people who you were surrounding yourself with. And that is powerful. It is powerful to put yourself in a room with people who are ahead of you or doing the things you want to do or having the conversations that you want to have. It's, I think it was Tony, I don't know if it was Tony Robbins, but somebody who said you are the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. And so when we're talking about environment, there's lots of things that sometimes we cannot change. Sometimes we can't change our location where we're living. But what we can do is what you did, which is to really have an assessment of who we're spending our time with and get really honest with ourselves about are they adding to my life experience or are they taking away from it? And that can be hard to make those shifts and make those changes and have those honest conversations with ourselves where we really say, okay, are these people adding? I am actually going to have to shift them. If they're not, I'm going to have to make some significant changes if the people that I have surrounded myself with are not really helping me move in the direction that I want to move in. And what a beautiful opportunity because when we really do shift up 
those people and start having the conversations and the powerful conversations that we need to have, then voila, like you say, our environment can really be a support and can accelerate the change process. Absolutely. And funny enough, this podcast, it's also one of the tools that I use to change my environment by talking with people like you that are far away in life in different area of business or the way they think. It's such a powerful way to be surrounded by individuals that you can learn from and you can understand how they are seeing life and so on. Sometimes, yeah, it might be hard to find your tribe in the place that you live, but we are living in a world where we, we are at the seconds away from anyone. Like we literally can build your tribe online and find the people that you resonate with, that you can learn from. And yeah, you should never be the smartest person in the room. That's for sure. Because otherwise it's so hard to improve, so hard to learn something new. You mentioned one thing about failure. I'm not a parent, but I know a lot of my friends that are parents and they experience different type of challenges, especially nowadays when technology is everywhere and so on. How do you make sure your kids grow up the right way, let's say? <laughs> because there is a right way. <laughs> <laughs> you take them to Bali. Everyone move to Bali and send their children to jungle school like I do. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> Really, honestly, we, we did move here specifically for the school and for the experience that our children would be able to have here. And I'm totally appreciative of the fact that this is not available for everybody and it may not be everybody's, it may not be what everybody else wants to do. So the first thing I would say is there is absolutely no right way and there are no perfect parents. We are all muddling through it trying to work our best like how this all works how do we manage these little souls that have shown up in our lives because our job really is as a guide and a teacher being a parent and so I think a lot of when it comes to parenting for me and you know I'm not a parenting guru all I know is that I have two children and I coach adults and I coach my children a lot as well. But it's about really letting go of control, a lot of control that we need to have over these beautiful little souls in our lives and allowing them to really be who they are and allowing them to flourish with all of their gifts. And what I find in my work with entrepreneurs is that if we're interconnected, we think we live lives, we actually live patterns. And the entrepreneurs that I work with who are parents come to me, not because of parenting, they come to me to up-level their businesses. And actually, all of the work that we do has ripple effects across their parenting because they're building their self-awareness and reflection muscle, because they're learning about their patterns, they're learning about their triggers, they're learning about all the things that are coming up in their relationship with their children. And so they're able to just be much more aware and understanding and then make different choices. You know, everything is inter interconnected. Business and our family life is intimately interconnected. Yes, indeed. And we often don't realize that we think we have a business problem and if we can solve this, everything else will fall into place. And while that's the case, is because you do the groundwork that affects every single thing in your life. And that's the interesting part about working on yourself and asking for help, self-improving, and arriving at a place where you can actually say, yes, I am someone that put in the work to overcome what was holding me back. And speaking of that, asking for help, I know in so many culture, it's like a taboo subject because it makes you feel weak. It makes you feel as someone that didn't figure it out when, of course, it shouldn't be the case. 
what you'll tell someone that is going through that stage and reluctant to ask for help, reluctant to find a solution to the things that are holding them back? Yeah, so many people have support wounds, which is what I like to call them, which is a belief that they cannot ask for support, that they cannot be supported, that they need to do everything themselves, that they can't rely on other people, that they do it the best and other people don't do it up to their standard. There's lots of things which are mixed in with an inability to be supported. And so it actually comes firstly, if you're in this situation, it has to come with a desire to actually want to shift and change it because it can be quite a sticky pattern to change. So it has to come with the desire, like all change, it has to come from a desire because change isn't easy. <laughs> Let's not beat around the bush and pretend that change is just easy for all of us because then we would all just live these absolutely incredible, fulfilled lives. Change is hard. Change requires the consistency that we were talking about earlier, like this dedication to wanting things to be different. So it starts there when we talk about really wanting to change this pattern and then having a look underneath to see what it is that's stopping you from allowing in that support. What is it? And if you were going to just allow in 5% more support, what would that look like? Who's the one person in your life that wants to support you, that you have not been allowing to support you. And that could be in your personal life, in your professional life. Who is that person that you can start practicing with and start building up your support muscle? Because what generally happens with support is that we don't trust other people. So we have to start building up this trust in other people. And so that 5% and just allowing that one person in your life who has been there waiting to offer you some support, allowing them to do that just starts the process. That's really powerful. And sharing from my own life experience, it was about six or seven years ago when I finally let go of that fear and that pre-programming of I have to do everything myself. I'm the best at what I do and so on. And when I made that shift and finally asking for help, everything changed business-wise because I was allowing myself to work on the business, not only inside the business. I was allowing myself to see things from a different perspective. I zoom out and I was able to see what's working and what not while having support in different areas of my business. And even if... I am a solopreneur, I don't have full-time employees and so on. I work with a lot of contractors and outsource a lot. And that part allows me to do a better work for my clients. That before I was just a freelancing that freelancer that I was having certain amount of time to work on, certain amount of skills, and that was it. And allowing ourselves to see that, first of all, we are never the best at what we do. There are always someone better than us and second to be able to actually have that power to as you mentioned to build that help muscle to build that ask for help even a habit because you don't have to walk around and help me to everyone but to identify the things that you can get help with in your life is such a powerful skill, especially if you're an entrepreneur. I 100% agree. And usually what happens is people get to this point where there is so much pain and they're in so much overwhelm and there is so much stress and maybe they've had a burnout or they're heading for burnout. But you don't have to wait until you get to that point in order to start building your support muscle. You can do it at any time. In fact, it's better to do it when you haven't had a burnout 
then you may never get there. So really starting to allow yourself, allow in support, allow other people to support you so that you can really have more time if that's what you want in your life. You can have a bit more time freedom. You can have a bit more flexibility because that's what support allows us generally. It allows us to do more of the things that we really want to do or to grow our businesses at a much faster pace than we would be able to if we were just doing it alone. Yes, indeed. And speaking of asking for help, if someone is listening and they want to work with you and connect with you, what will be the easiest way for them to get in touch? You can head over to my website, which is helenaday.com. And you, or you can look me up on Instagram, Helena at helenaroseday.com. Perfect. And I'll put the links in the show notes as well. And I love to wrap up by giving those listening a small challenge, something that can finish in less than one week in order to walk this path of getting help. Is there any self-reflection or any exercise they can do in order to uncover the things that they need help with or what will be your challenge for them? You know what, I just, we've talked about it and I would really, first of all, ask yourself the question, what would it look like in your life if you allowed in just 5% more support? What would shift? What would change? Ask yourself that as a reflection question. And then I would have a look and get really honest with yourself and look for the one person in your life that has been offering or wanting to give you more support and allow them to give you that support and see how it feels. Notice what happens for you when you're allowing that support. Notice what shifts and what changes. That's really powerful because you more often than none, we have those person in our lives that they are willing to help, they are willing to support us, but we don't allow them. We are stubborn. We can do everything. We don't need help. We, we are powerful. And if we're, especially men that are listening, that are in that position that we as the powerful sex, we have to be the strongest and so on. And we don't need to reveal our flaws or our imperfections. That's so wrong. And just get the help that we need to move forward. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Elena, for joining us today. It was a wonderful conversation from which me personally, I took a lot of notes and a lot of things that I want to start applying. And hopefully those listening took the same. They took a pen and paper and actually took some notes. Beautiful. And then they can use their notes to do their self-reflection underneath. You, yes, you, you're one of the few that stick to the end. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing so. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so below. And if you got any value from this, please share it with a friend. They might got some value from it as well. Thank you so much. And until next week, Pura Vida!